Dee Corrida, I'm Michelle Cullity. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all to our fourth webinar, STEM and Sport, our final webinar in the STEM Sawalia webinar series. Over the next hour or so, we hope to share with you some ideas and insights into the learning opportunities that we all have in our own homes that could be utilised during the challenge of distance learning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Timmons. We're really looking forward to exploring STEM and sport with you this morning uh, over the next hour. We hope that you all have a cup of tea or coffee and maybe even a nice little treat with you too. Sit back, relax and enjoy the content we've prepared for you this morning. We are delighted once again with the level of interest in today's webinar exceeding our expectations again. So thank you very much for taking the time to join us this morning. Eva Marginis, Misha Kathleen Byrne. We're really looking forward to exploring STEM and sport with you. And our colleagues Barbara and Siobhan are on hand to answer any questions you may have during the webinar. Our key messages for today's webinar are on screen now. STEM integration means planning for rich tasks which explore mathematics and science skills and content meaningfully rather than in a tokenistic way. Integrated STEM learning involves carefully planned activities which interweave content skills and concepts relevant to science and maths using technology and engineering opportunities. STEM learning experiences should be linked to real world contexts where pupils have the opportunity to apply and develop problem solving and reasoning skills in an authentic and creative way. The primary SESE curriculum centers around the pupils understanding and appreciation for their own local, local context and environment, spiraling outwards into exploration of the wider world. STEM tasks and learning experiences should provide opportunities to engage pupils in productive struggle harnessing their natural curiosity to solve problems in the world around them. Inquiry-based and playful pedagogies can support pupil learning in STEM in all contexts and settings. Children's current understanding and existing ideas should be used as a starting point in STEM, with teachers eliciting, supporting and extending these through appropriate questioning. The 1971 primary school curriculum placed a huge emphasis on environment-based learning and activity and discovery methods. These principles were revised and again endorsed in the 1999 curriculum, where a wider range of learning principles were introduced. Four of these principles can be seen in green and have helped to influence our content today, as well as the quote at the bottom of your screen, first-hand experience that actively engages the child with the immediate environment and with those who live in it is the most effective basis for learning. Before we begin to explore the theme of STEM and sport, we wanted to highlight some outstanding resources which have been produced on this topic in the past few weeks and months. As we have all found ourselves in really challenging times, our response as a team has also been challenging. Our primary focus has always been on bespoke contextualised school support and building relationships. While we have continued to work with schools individually in this changed environment, we also recognise the need to support teachers in their distance learning endeavours. Hence the design of this webinar series and accompanying resources that we hope benefit you now and well into the future when you return to school. Similarly, our colleagues on the PE team responded innovatively with the launch of the Beyond the Classroom PE at Home series. The aim of the programme was to support children's fundamental movement skills at home through a series of activity packs and video clips in English and Irish. Three new videos and activity packs are launched each week and can be found at the address on screen. We are sure these have been invaluable to teachers and parents alike, and we commend our colleagues on the PE team for the development of these. Tutors Aina Casey and Adrian Ormsby have developed an outstanding resource for schools who are missing the opportunity to hold a traditional sports day. In conjunction with Sligo Education Centre, the virtual sports day resource began as a series of live webinars. The website features a step-by-step -step guide on how you can host a virtual sports day as well as, suite, as a suite of resources with explainer videos, music playlists and suggested equipment that you might have around the house. Some of the activities featured are from the PDST Move Well, Move Often resource. We would like to congratulate Aina, Adrian and all at Sligo Education Centre on their work in compiling this for schools. It is well worth checking it out. Today's webinar will take the following format. We will be finished the introductory session shortly, after which we will be exploring three different sub-themes of STEM and sport. 
Under each of the sub-themes, the human body and sport, games and sports equipment. We will examine curricular links, sample learning experiences and additional resources. We will conclude today's webinar by guiding you towards some useful resources available to schools and answering some of your questions should time permit. We would love your participation in today's webinar and this can be done in a number of ways. Throughout the hour we will ask you to take part in numerous polls which will appear on your screen and help us to interact with each other. If at any stage during the webinar you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Our colleagues Barbara and Siobhan are on hand to help answer any of your STEM queries and will endeavour to get to as many questions as possible. At the end of the webinar you will be directed to an evaluation form. We have made this as short and manageable as possible and would greatly appreciate your feedback as it will help to guide us for the upcoming webinars. We have compiled a lot of the resources which we will look at during the webinar, including teacher-friendly reference sheets and documents. These are currently being uploaded to our website and we hope to guide you towards them at the end of the webinar. Once again, please don't feel the need to write furiously during the webinar. We want you to have a pleasant learning experience and we also hope to make a recording of this webinar available to participants after the event. We might just take this opportunity to find out a little bit more about the audience as you will see your first poll appear on screen. Thank you so much for your participation with our poll and it's fabulous to see so many different class levels represented here today. A varied audience indeed. I would now like to hand you over to my colleague Kathleen who will explore our first sub theme with you, the human body. Over to you Kathleen. Thank you so much Michelle. The human body holds great fascination to young minds. Kids come up with the most curious of questions such as how many times do you breathe in and out during a day? How much does your heart weigh? Some of these questions allow for pupils' own research, while others, such as how many times does your heart beat during one day, encourage child-led inquiry. In this section, we will examine the following three areas that correlate the human body with sport. There is little or no equipment needed for the following activities, so they are perfect for distance learning at home and equally back in the classroom if you find yourself under-resourced. If you joined us for our previous webinars, you will be familiar with the layout for mapping our theme to the curriculum and to skills development. We use the Poplet app to create this image. We'll give you a moment to examine the areas of maths and science curriculum that we hope to explore using the theme of the human body. The human body is incredible and the possibilities of what the human body can achieve in sports are phenomenal. At primary level, the science strand units of myself and human life offer the child an opportunity to explore and investigate various aspects in the spiraled approach from junior infants to sixth class. With cross-curricular integration with SPHE, it's vital that children become aware of how to look after their bodies, from nutrition and hydration, to healthy activities, to joyful play and sleep. Here we will examine just two elements that are vital for optimum sports and fitness performance, the heart, and muscle fatigue. The heart is an excellent example of enduring reliable body technology. Monitoring your resting heart rate is a very effective method for assessing the fitness level of an athlete and in general it's a very reliable indicator of cardiovascular health. We can use our own heartbeat as a trigger for investigation and inquiry. The rate our heartbeat depends on how old we are, how fit we are and what we are doing. But do children know how to take their own heartbeat? Now is the time to practice. Take your heartbeat using two fingers, not your thumb, on your wrist or neck. Measure your resting heart rate while you're calmly sitting for 10 seconds. Convert this to a minute. How will you do that? Measure your heart rate after a variety of activities, such as running, jumping jacks, playing football, etc. To scaffold junior children, calculate how many more beats did you count in 10 seconds? What is the difference to your resting heartbeat? To extend senior pupils, calculate the percentage increase for each activity compared to your resting heart rate. What else could children investigate? Encourage them to come up with their own child-led inquiry following these activities. Extend this activity by graphing the data. Sports scientists often analyze the data of athletes to see how they are progressing. Some children have smart watches that give data on heart rates. Check how accurate it is compared to the two-finger method. 
Ensuring accuracy and reliability is an important component of the work of scientists and mathematicians. Children can analyze and interpret data on their smart technology over a week-long period if that is something that interests them. For simple guidance regarding exercise on your heart, see this activity from Discover Primary Science and Maths. Alternatively, consider setting the challenge of estimating the number of times a heart beats in a lifetime of an average person. Maths Eyes Ireland have some super posters such as this to inspire such curiosity and inquiry. Whether you are starting to work out for the first time or you are a professional athlete, muscle fatigue is a normal side effect of exercise. Fatigue is your body's way of adapting to a fitness regime and making you aware that you have reached your metabolic limit. Here is a simple activity for all ages that will explore muscle fatigue. In this activity, students investigate muscle fatigue using the action of opening and closing a clothes peg. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, wait till you try it. Hold the clothes peg comfortably between the thumb and forefinger of the hand you write with. Practice quickly opening and closing the clothes peg for a few seconds, making sure you open it all the way each time. Count the number of times you can open the clothes peg in 30 second intervals. When the timekeeper says go, open and close the peg as fast as you can and count aloud each time you open the peg. Record the result on the template provided. Results can be subsequently graphed on a bar chart or a trend graph. Check out this short video of this child engaging with the peg test. This is a great opportunity for analysis and interpretation with guiding questions such as, how do you know your muscles got tired? Can you see a difference on the graph between results as time lengthens? What happens if you tried with your less dominant hand? Is there a difference? Are your results consistent with other family members? Further investigation could be developed by designing an experiment to answer one of the following questions. How long a period of rest do finger muscles need before you can repeat the experiment and get the same results as your first trial? Is there a gender difference in finger muscle fatigue? Do the fittest students in the class also have the fittest fingers? Do the musicians in the class have the fittest fingers? Last week, we discussed the importance of offering children choice. By inviting children to answer just one of these questions through their own investigation, you will empower them in their role as independent scientists. While this is an inclusive activity for all, be aware of children with weak muscles and severe motor issues. If a peg is too challenging for their motor skills, perhaps tapping a foot or a finger is appropriate for them. What do the following photos have in common? Each one is developing the reaction time through various activities. Piano players and video gamers can have a quick reaction time that can come in handy while playing sports. On the field, if you fall in football, rugby or hurling, you need to get back on your feet as quick as possible to react to what's coming. And who from my generation doesn't remember the classic reaction game Simon Says? Reaction skills are an important part of many athletes' training. Take a look at Nathan Flanagan here, who went viral during COVID-19 as he practiced his goalkeeping reaction times alone in his back garden. Oh. A dedicated goalkeeper, no doubt. So what do we mean by reaction? Reaction time measures how swiftly you interpret and then react to expected and unexpected events happening around you. An example of reaction time is the interim between hearing the starter's pistol and beginning to run. Reaction times in sport need to be quick. A boxer needs to dodge blows from his or her opponent. A rugby player needs to react to an opponent breaking the line. And Nathan has just displayed how reactive a goalkeeper needs to be. The BBC show Catchpoint is one example of utilising a reaction task. In school, you probably have already organised reaction games and activities such as dodgeball, snatch the bacon, reaction sprints and more. 
check out the dodging activities from the Beyond the Classroom series Michelle mentioned earlier. But have you ever considered why you were playing these games? When you react to a stimulus, your senses need to send a signal through your sensory neurons or nerve cells to your brain. Your brain then needs to make sense of that signal, decide what to do, and then send the right signals to the appropriate muscles for you to move. There is plenty of science to explore, from human anatomy to our senses that help us to be aware of the world around us, in particular the dangers. Aside from the underlying science, reaction activities require mathematical elements, such as measuring time and speed, accurately calculating results, and subsequently recording, analyzing, and interpreting data. The six components of motor skills related to fitness are agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed. You carry out motor skills when your brain, nervous system, and muscles work together to move parts of your body in large or small maneuvers. Motor skills improve with practice and a well-rounded athlete needs to work to improve each of the six equally. Here we have a short video of a variety of reaction activities for children of all ages and abilities. We have shared a resource sheet of videos and tasks on our website. To extend this activity, encourage pupils to design and create their own reaction task. Challenge your friends to complete it. It's a great opportunity to improve all motor skills and who knows, like Nathan, you too might go viral. The Olympics is a magical event for children when they become astounded by the prowess of men and women from around the world in their chosen field. Unfortunately, due to the international pandemic, this year's Olympics have been postponed. But that doesn't stop us from examining previous winners and inspiring our young athletes to try out their own family Olympics or virtual class Olympics at home. Take a look at these athletes. Can you name them? Each of these are 2016 Olympic gold medal winners. Usain Bolt is familiar to us all, running the men's 100 meter race in 9.81 seconds. Diana Bartoletta jumped 7.17 meters to win the women's long jump. Michelle Carter won gold in the women's shot put with a distance of 20.63 metres, while Ryan Krauser won the men's event with a distance of 22.52 metres. Begin by encouraging children to research Olympians or simply provide them with information such as this. What does a jump of 7.17 metres actually look like? Can you measure it out? If you jump from the starting point, where do you land within 7.17 metres? Can you work out the fraction or percentage of an Olympian jump you can reach? Take Bolt's 100 meter sprint. How long is 9.81 seconds? Time it and see. What can you do in 9.81 seconds? How far is 100 meters? How long does it take you to run it? And how about your mum, dad or sibling? Can you increase your speed and if so, how? How about a throw of either 20.63 meters or 22.52 meters? How far is that? You may actually need to go to a park or field to measure it. And while you won't have a shot put, can you throw a ball that far? Again, how far from the starting point will your ball land within the measured distance? Does it matter which ball you use? All of these guiding questions are the introduction to inquiry in sport. Of course we are not Olympians and we cannot achieve their distance or times, but we can certainly use it as a stimulus for exploration and investigation. Now that June has arrived, we know many schools are hosting virtual sports days and home Olympics. And there are lots of resources to support you with this, including the wonderful webpage Virtual Sports Day mentioned by Michelle at the beginning, and these Olympic 2016 resources available on Skullnet. 
Increase distance learning opportunities by using STEM eyes on these activities. Consider the maths possibilities integrated, including length and time and measures, data and number. Science skills of prediction, questioning, investigation, analysis and recording can be practiced and developed through some simple investigations. Using our four Olympians as inspiration, establish three games for the family Olympics for the children to begin with. Include the long jump, the longest throw and the 100 meter sprint. As a start to your Olympic Games, complete each activity three times. Work out your average and record the data. Each participating family member could do this. Allow children to make their own decision. Will you accept the average as the final result or will you choose your best performance from your three efforts? The next step is for the children to create their own event. This allows for creativity, individual interest, personal talent and practicalities of each home setting. Being mindful of COVID-19 guidelines surrounding distancing and hand hygiene, had them consider who and how they could take part. To extend this activity, ask children to investigate does practicing affect your results? They could measure and record the results weekly over a month or even the whole summer. Using their first result as a benchmark, does practice improve results? How could these results be presented to the class on return in September? The Olympics gives excellent opportunities for inclusive activities and interaction. Examine the work of Special Olympics Ireland and Paralympics Ireland. Have you ever wondered what differences the three have with each other? Bowling is one sport that is included in the Special Olympics, but not in the Olympics. Boccia is one sport that is included in the Paralympics, but also not included in the Olympics. Both sports are suitable for all ages and abilities. PDST Primary PE have developed the series Move Well, Move Often and Book 3 has a full bowling activity with an accompanying video on the Virtual Sports Day site mentioned earlier. In 2016, in anticipation of the Rio Paralympics, Channel 4 released a brilliant ad entitled We're the Superhumans. These three minutes of extraordinary sportsmanship can inspire all children to set goals and reach for the stars. There are huge opportunities for examining technology in the field of sport, but through this video alone. Here's a but a short clip of the full three minutes. Yes, I can. 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 Hey, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. Are you ready? I can climb Everest. Yes, I can. I can fight here all night and never rest. Yes, I can. I was just born today. I can go all the way. Yes, Absolutely outstanding. So for further information on some of these activities, see the following sources. Over to Michelle now for some creative approaches to game design. Thank you so much, Kathleen. What a fantastic video you shared with us there. Before we get started looking at games, we might just check in with Paul and see are there any questions coming in, Paul, that you'd like to field for us? Super, thanks very much, Michelle. Um, yeah, a few questions coming in so far. Uh, we've one here from Brian uh, that I thought I might, might answer live. Uh, Brian says, I really like the PEG test uh, from the first section. I've never seen tasks like this before, exploring muscle fatigue. Uh, and Brian asks, have you got any more ideas for tasks such as this one? Um, so again, thanks very much for this question, Brian. Uh, it really is a fantastic task that children really enjoy exploring, you know. Um, but in terms of other ideas, you could find a lot online, but in the current circumstances, we have a great opportunity to explore this even more. Um, why not challenge children to come up with their own um, tasks and challenges to explore muscle fatigue? This could be anything. It could be running around the back garden. It could be running around the, the housing estate, uh, hitting a ball off the wall, perhaps. Anything really that involves repetitive movements and a kind of, a, I suppose, a specific time limit as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Brian. It's, it's really the sky's the limit with it. You can go as far as you want. And I'll hand you back now uh, to Michelle to take us through the second section. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much, Paul. That's super. Thanks a million. 
Okay, so we're just about to look at our second sub theme of games. So we can all reflect fondly on games that we played in our own childhood with our siblings and friends. Conkers, Curbs, Tip the Can and British Bulldog provided endless hours of fun on the playground and in fields and green areas. None of the games I enjoyed as a child were heavily reliant on commercial equipment and this period in our lives has certainly inspired a return to simpler times and a heightened level of imagination and innovation in terms of the games we play. Within this subsection, we have selected three activities, STEM eyes in sport, design a crazy golf course, and balloon games. We have linked our, linked our theme to the curriculum, as can be seen on the poplet on screen. I will give you a moment to look at this. Our first activity is STEM eyes in sport. Some of you may be familiar with the Maths Eyes program. Having Maths Eyes changes the view of mathematics as something that is done in school to something that can be real and meaningful in our lives. In a similar fashion, we are challenging children to look at a sport or a sports person that they are interested in or admire as a starting point for this activity. When children have decided who or what they will choose to look at, we would encourage them to use STEM Eyes to look at their chosen sport. Children could analyse the cost of playing this sport or the cost of being a spectator. Perhaps you might prefer to focus on the materials required to play a certain game and analyse why these materials have been chosen and what could be an alternative material. This task is easily adapted for all class and ability levels. A junior infant might only see numbers or shapes, whereas a senior pupil might analyse lines and angles, forces and symmetry. A photograph provides an open invitation for all pupils to explore and take ownership of. We have compiled a number of task cards for this activity, which you will find in the resources section of our website. If we take a look at the sport of hurling or camogie as an example, let's see what we can see with our math size. I will give you a moment to read the questions on screen and consider if you can think of any other mathematical questions or observations. If we decide to look at a sports person that we admire, in this case, Shane Lowry, what can we see with our science eyes? Children would enjoy the freedom to choose a sports person of their choice, local, national or international, who they might like to explore using their STEM eyes. We have a guide for teachers in the resource section of our website where you will find ideas for how to challenge the children at all class levels to engage with this activity. Have a look at this image from a hurling match. This image features in the hurling section of the GAA website where you will also find some skills videos. If we ask you to look at this photograph using your STEM eyes, what is the first thing that you would see? Please share your first thoughts with us as you will see a poll appear on your screen now. Thank you so much for your participation. Isn't it funny that the vast majority of you saw number first? I would have been the same myself. We asked a little girl in second class to make observations about this photograph with her STEM eyes on. Let's see how she got on. All of the players on the wine colour team have even numbers on their back. This stripy jersey is an odd number. There are five hurlies in the picture. The lines on the picture are straight. The goal looks like it is a rectangle. 
I think this letter is travelling fast because the players look like they are off bal balance. This letter was very high because the goalkeeper is stretched. The, go the holies look like they are made from wood, but there is a different material on the handle. Maybe plastic because it is shiny. Number 13 is nearly holding his, hur his hurley at a right angle. Careful questioning could encourage this student to extend her thinking. A parent or teacher could focus her attention on the goal net, for example. How were these designed? What considerations were necessary for the design? What characteristics would the materials used need to have? How long do you think the net will last before needing replacement? Are there factors that might affect this? Choosing a photograph that would appeal to the interests of an individual pupil may help to increase their motivation to engage. Allowing children to choose their own photograph could provide a variety of responses to this task, which could be collated and shared with classmates in the future. This activity might also provide a nice starting point for project work. Our next activity is design a crazy golf course. Some pupils might have first-hand experience of a crazy golf course, while others may need images and videos to support and inspire their thinking. This task can be used by students of all class levels. It can also be used in a wide variety of school and distance learning contexts. The design and make process of the primary science curriculum should be used so students become comfortable using the engineering design process. During the exploration stage of this activity, images and videos of golf can be shared and discussed with students. Examine the different kinds of shots, swings, clubs used and hazards. Explore the possible use of clean, recyclable materials as well as other materials or equipment from the home that could be used as equipment or hazards. As the children design their golf course, they could choose to draw a label diagram. They will need to decide how many holes they're going to have, how many hazards will be included, and how big or small will the golf course be. As children assemble their course in the making stage, they could take photos of the step-by-step -step process. These photos can be used again if they have to tidy up their course and want to reassemble it with modifications. When the course has been set up, it's time to evaluate. What worked really well on your course? Is there anything you would do differently the next time? There is a task card for this activity available in the resource section of our website. We challenged some children to design their own golf club during the week. And here is an image of what designs they came up with using materials from around the home. Children could be encouraged to use recyclable or natural materials to create their golf clubs. Perhaps some short criteria could be added to the task detailing what height the golf club should be, or maybe a minimum weight. Is your golf club suitable for a left-handed or right-handed player? Would an adult be able to use it? The children then designed a simple five-hole golf course and challenged their parents to complete it. They decided that each hole would have a key feature and named the holes accordingly. Hole one was called the tunnel. Hole two, the chair bridge. Hole three was the reading corner. Hole four was the water bridge. And finally, hole five was the teddy corner. Maybe you could challenge the pupils to use a theme when creating their golf course. They could create a teddy themed golf course, a book themed golf course, or a golf course using only natural materials. We hope that these images might give you some ideas for your own designs. Don't forget to share them with us on Twitter. Our final activity is balloon games. Again, there is an air of nostalgia around playing with balloons. Imagine in days gone by the excitement we all experienced when there were balloons at a birthday party. Long before party bags became a thing, it was the icing on the cake if you were allowed to take home a balloon from a party. You knew the opportunities for fun that could be explored in the next few days with a simple balloon. We have linked this activity with maths and science, as can be seen on screen. Depending on the activities selected and the age and ability level, balloon games can be used to explore many concepts outside of these. We are highlighting the opportunities for games with balloons in this activity by looking at balloon tennis and swing balloon activities. Children can be challenged to design their own tennis rackets to take part in these games by exploring materials available to them in their own home. We challenge this brother and sister to try out balloon tennis and swing balloon. Let's have a look and see how they got on. 
I played some balloon games with my brother today. We made three rackets using paper plates. We used three different handles, a spatula, a wooden spoon and an empty tin foil roll. I decorated the paper plates. We used two different balloons, a small one and a large one. The first game we played was balloon tennis. We used masking tape for the net and kept scores. The small balloon was hard to play with because it didn't float as well as the big one. We kept scores and had loads of fun. We tied the balloon to the ceiling and played balloon swing ball. We used our hands and then we used the rackets. I played on my own as well with my hands. It was hard to time when to hit the balloon because it floated slowly sometimes. I played with the balloon and the rackets on my own too. We made up some games on my own. I thought these activities were great fun and I can't wait to invent some more. I'm going to test some different rackets tomorrow and see if I can improve. I never knew balloons could be so much fun. The opportunities for extending these games are endless. Balloon tennis can become balloon hockey, balloon soccer, dodge balloon, etc. Children may require a sample game to awaken their creativity and we, we think these two games can do just that. When children have explored balloon tennis and swing balloon and experienced fun and success with both, why not challenge them to then design their own balloon game? Encourage children to find materials around the house that might help them to design their balloon game. Could we use recycled materials to make hockey sticks? Can we make our own nets somehow? Can you find an object to catch a balloon with? Would a paper cup work? How many players can take part in your game? Is it possible to design a game that can be played on your own for children who don't have any siblings at home? Do you think it's important to have rules in your game? Are they necessary? Will you have a scoring system? Is the game suitable for a playground where social distancing rules apply? Is it possible to play your game if you're unable to stand? Maybe children could be challenged to design a balloon game suitable for a child who cannot see or hear. A child's natural curiosity and imagination could provide great inspiration for their game design. Maybe they could use digital technology to explain and demonstrate their game. And hopefully someday, when we're back in school, children might get an opportunity to do a real life demonstration of their game in the PE hall or school playground. For further online resources on this topic, please see the web, web links on screen now. I will pass you back to Paul now to explore our next sub theme, sports equipment. That's great. Thanks very much, Michelle. Uh, just before we do, we might pop over to Kathleen. I, I hear there are some more questions to be answered, uh, Kathleen. Thanks, Paul. I'm just having a look on the chat there and I see Geraldine really enjoyed your STEM eyes, Michelle. And she was just wondering, you know, where are, she thought you mentioned a website there or something. So where can she get it? So Geraldine, you know, have you got mattseyes.com? Loads of lovely um, posters, etc., and videos to check out there. Also explorify.co.uk has some zoom in, zoom outs, what's going on, odd one outs and things like that. Um, but I tell you, Geraldine, when you turn your STEM eyes, you're, going, you're never going to watch a match in the same way again. You'll be seeing STEM all over the place in it. So good luck with that now, Geraldine. Back to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Kathleen. Super. Okay, uh, our third sub-theme for this, this morning's webinar is indeed sports equipment. Throughout this section, we'll be exploring three STEM activities which promote maths, science and STEM skill development. They are called Best Bounce, sail or fail, and amazing arenas. Similar to the previous poppets you've seen today, this theme allows for teachers to plan for learning experiences which explore maths and science skills alongside content meaningfully. Please take a moment now to consider these suggested integrated strands and skills. Our first activity in the sub-theme of sports equipment is called Best Bounce. This activity will explore a number of questions, including what makes a particular ball bouncy or not, and what surface is the best to bounce a ball on. I am sure I'm not alone in remembering my own amazement as I watched this now famous Sony advert from 2005, which featured 250,000 bouncy balls making their way down a steep San Francisco street. 
There's something captivating and engaging about the whole scene, and it inspired so many questions for me. How did they clear up afterwards? Was there any damage caused by the bouncy balls either to cars or buildings along this street? Perhaps this video could be shown as a thinking trigger into this activity, Best Bounce, to encourage children to start thinking about the properties and characteristics of bouncy balls. Why are they so bouncy? Would this advert have been as effective if they used footballs or tennis balls? Would they have bounced as high? Would they have traveled for so long? Another excellent thinking trigger that can be used to generate rich discussion and a sharing of ideas is a concept cartoon. The idea of concept cartoons originally came from Brenda Kyo and Stuart Naylor as a way to encourage children to consider different opinions and perspectives relating to a particular scientific or STEM topic. After reading the different opinions, as you can see here, children can decide which they feel is the correct opinion for them. This concept cartoon is from the Eureka magazine, which is freely available for teachers to access on the cog.ie website referenced below. The Eureka magazine features a wealth of resources for teachers to use in the teaching of science, and this link will also be shown at the end of this section of the webinar. In some cartoon na kunkapsho, sprag turn a poshti kuna dormi a rind fui liro de kiapenshid a muli on Tolliver Deuce. On kian trum, on kian adrum, no on kiapenshid gamuli na liro di on Tolliver Lakela. Togan gniviacht marsho, desh and vuntor, masunu a yenov. August ain me hishkinti ata egdalti ahent. Concept cartoons provide an opportunity for children to take inspiration from what they see and to devise their own testable questions in relation to a particular topic. Concept cartoons can be found in many places on the internet. Uh, you may wish to visit the Science Learn link shown on screen here to find out more about concept cartoons. Here you will also find some editable cartoons that you can use now or indeed when we return to school. Perhaps as an additional option, as you can see here, you could include a blank speech bubble in your concept cartoon so that the child has space to include an alternative opinion to those already listed. In this instance, they might wonder, what would happen if we change the height we are dropping them from? What would happen if the wind was blowing, for example? Following this rich discussion generated by the thinking triggers, it's time to begin the investigation. Depending on the child's age and ability, this investigation can take many different directions from this point onwards. Some children may wish to search their home to find as many balls as they can, such as footballs, tennis balls, basketballs, etc. Other children might wish to explore what materials in their home they can make a ball from, such as wool, balled up socks, etc. Or indeed things that could be turned into a ball, such as a collection of rubber bands, a ball of paper, rolled up sellotape, and so on. Maybe some older children would like to explore making their own bouncy ball using a recipe such as this one. Once the child has decided which approach they're going to take for this investigation, it's important at this stage to decide on the purpose of, it, of the investigation and to set some criteria. This could include a number of things, such as, are we saying the ball that bounces the highest is the bounciest ball? Or is it the ball that bounces the most times is the bounciest ball? Our friends over at Discover Primary Science and Maths have included this wonderful task card to explore the bounciest ball that may be useful for teachers both now during this period of distance learning and when we return to school. Other children, taking a step further, may wish to instead explore different surfaces to examine which is the best surface to bounce a ball on. So once the child has decided on the success criteria, they can then begin to make predictions about what they think will happen. Perhaps the child could use an investigation sheet, such as this one, available in the resources section of our website, in English, August Oskwelga, uh, which will help the child to develop their science skills of recording, predicting, investigating, as well as a range of math skills, such as reasoning and problem solving, as they progress through the task. With the predictions complete, there's one more thing to consider before beginning this investigation. How will we make sure that this is a fair test? As we discussed in our previous webinars, a fair test involves changing one element of the investigation each time while ensuring that everything else remains the same. In this investigation, depending on whether the child is focusing on changing the ball each time or the surface each time, they will call this the variable. As they have selected their variable, which is either the ball or the surface, it's important that all of the other conditions in the investigation remain the same throughout. As we said before, these are called our constants. Why not invite the child though to share some of the constants that they can think of? 
For example, what height are we going to drop the ball from? How can we make sure that this is the same each time? Following this, the child might consider how they're going to record the results of their investigation. Will they use a table or a chart? Maybe they could use digital technology to record the results. And finally, after the investigation is complete, you might encourage them to, to think further about investigations they can carry out in this area. Maybe they can explore which ball is the bounciest indoors and outdoors. Does the weather have an impact on how bouncy a ball is? If you'd like to explore this task further, this fabulous resource, Real Science for Young Scientists, produced by DCU St. Patrick's Campus, can be a great starting point. This activity, bounce, Bouncy Balls, which can be found on page 18 of this particular book, and many other great science and STEM tasks um, are explored in this free to access and use resource. Check it out at this link. Before beginning our second activity in the sub-theme of sports equipment, we would like to invite you to take a moment to look at this image. What sport do you think this team are celebrating winning during their visit to Oros and Neutron? Do you remember hearing about this or seeing these images? This team, of course, are celebrating their gold medal win in the European Frisbee Championships in November of last year. When considering sports, we can often focus on the more commonly seen or played sports, such as soccer, football, hurling, camogie, rugby, etc. But why not take some time either now during this period of distance learning or indeed when we return to school to explore some of the lesser known sports, such as ultimate frisbee? Maybe a sport such as this might appeal to children in a way that other sports do not. Maybe they might find that they have a particular talent for throwing a frisbee or other children might find the non-contact aspect of the sport appealing. More about this sport can be found at www.irishultimate.com. Activity two today, Sail or Fail, focuses on the main piece of equipment used during a game of Ultimate Frisbee, the Frisbee itself. Simply put, this activity is an investigation through which children will be engaging in inquiry-based and discovery learning by finding items to use as Frisbees or indeed creating their own Frisbees and then determining which is the best. Maybe this task could begin by, by taking some time to look at and if possible to hold and throw a Frisbee around. What about this Frisbee makes it sail through the air? Is the material that it is made from heavy or light? What shape is it? What angle is the best to throw it at? Next, challenge the children to explore their home, searching for objects or items that they think they could use as a Frisbee. Of course, with this task, safety has to come first. So it would be important that children get the appropriate guidance depending on their age and ability uh, for this task, whether that means they should be accompanied by an adult to collect the items or they need to double check with an adult before they start throwing items as Frisbees. We took the time ourselves this week to search in our own homes and some items we found and tested were jam jar lids, bottle tops, A4 sheets of cardboard, which we tested both as an A4 sheet in its rectangular shape and with a circle shape cut out from them, and a paper plate. But of course, these are just some suggestions. Once the materials have been gathered, it's important to consider how you're going to measure the success of each Frisbee. Once again, the investigation template available on our website might come in useful here. Can we use our skills of measurement to measure how far each Frisbee travels? If so, how are we going to record this? Or instead, are we going to time how long each Frisbee remains in the air for? Will we need someone else's help to start and stop the timer for this particular investigation? Uh, what, do we need to, what do we need to consider to make sure that this investigation is fair? What height are we going to throw the Frisbee from? Again, depending on the child's age and ability, there's an opportunity here to explore the fourth strand of the science, a uh, strand unit of the science curriculum further here too. What causes our Frisbee to stay in the air? What causes our Frisbee to fall? I wonder, does it fall at the same speed as the bouncy ball from the previous activity? Why or why not? The following video shows a fifth class child working through this task at home. As you watch this video, we'd like you to consider what maths, science and STEM skills she is practicing and developing throughout. <laughs>
as you can see, uh, this child then decided to record her results in a bar chart uh, and found, perhaps surprisingly, that the coaster was the best frisbee in her, in her home, given that it traveled the furthest. Maybe if there's still great interest from the child after carrying out this investigation, further investigations could be carried out in the same set of frisbees. Which one stays in the air the longest? Which is the most accurate? Or maybe the child might even wish to take some time to learn the rules of the sport ultimate frisbee and play a small game at home with members of their family. A possible extension for this activity, uh, perhaps is to challenge the child to make their own boomerang. Once again, maybe they might wish to research boomerangs and to develop an understanding of the characteristics that allow it to return to the original thrower. Would any of these materials that we've used for the frisbee task be suitable for making a boomerang? Another possible extension for this activity um, could be for the children to apply what they've learned through exploring forces to design and make their own paper airplanes. Once again, they could carry out the investigation, maybe this time focusing on which type of paper works the best or which design helps their plane fly the furthest. A range of resources on paper plane investigations can be found on the NZ Maths website shown here, which includes tasks, rich questions and recording templates such as this one. Our third and final activity in the sub-theme of sports equipment is called Amazing Arenas. Once again, I'm sure I don't speak just for myself, when as a sports fan, I, I fondly recall the volume and energy of the crowd on All-Ireland final day, or the deafening roar of the fans at a soccer match when a goal is scored in the last minute. Many sports arenas hold special memories for people, whether it's a memorable day in Croke Park when your county won the All-Ireland final, the Aviva Stadium, the day Shane Long scored that wonderful goal against Germany in 2015, or thinking back to the Olympic Stadium in Sydney, where Sonia O'Sullivan won her silver medal in the 5,000 metre race back in the year 2000. Sports arenas of all types provide for some wonderful maths, science and STEM learning opportunities. For instance, consider this photograph and its potential to inspire rich discussion uh, for children. And perhaps they could use their maths, science and STEM eyes, as Michelle referred earlier, to estimate the number of people attending the match. Maybe they could think about the engineering of the stadium, are there pillars supporting the various sections of the stadium? How did the architects decide where to place these? Maybe the children, though, could use other STEM senses to engage with this activity. What sounds might you hear at a football match, such as these ones? This might be a particularly engaging activity for children, perhaps with a visual impairment, or maybe for children uh, to help them develop familiarity and awareness of the type of noises they will hear in advance of attending a match in the stadium, uh, such as the crowd cheering or the whistle, as you heard, or maybe buzzers or sirens that are different sporting arenas. There are many websites on which free royalty sound effects can be found for this specific reason. Um, the ones you have heard are taken from soundbible.com, but there are a range of websites available. For this task, though, we're going to challenge the child to design and make their own sports arena. This arena can be designed for any sport that they wish. It might even be a fictional sport, such as Quidditch, as seen in Harry Potter. As with all design and make activities, though, it's important to consider the four stages of the design and make process. Explore, plan, make and evaluate. Perhaps the previous activity of looking at a photograph of a stadium might serve once again as an engaging thinking trigger from which children can start the exploration. What materials will I use to make my arena? Which sport is it for? Could I use Lego, cardboard, or a mixture of recyclable materials? Could I make it even out of spaghetti and marshmallows? Once they've gathered the materials, it's time to move to the planning stage of the process. Children might take the time here to consider the engineering aspect of their arena. How am I going to get the sides to stand up? What shape will the arena be? How will I make that shape? They might sketch their plan as they go so they can refer back to it in the making stage of the process. With the plan complete, it's time to start making. As we've said in previous webinars, this stage can be the most fun, but also the most frustrating aspect of the design and make process, as children engage in productive struggle, problem solving, reasoning, and many other STEM areas throughout. It's important as much as they can to refer back to the original design as they work through this stage of the process. You'll see a Quidditch stadium, uh, on, on the left-hand side of your, of your screen here, uh, designed by a child. Uh, Crayola, to take this a step further, the Crayola, the Crayon Company, have a wonderful lesson plan for this specific task available for teachers to use on their website. It can be found at the link below, and it explores the potential maths, science, and STEM elements that children might wish to add to their stadium, depending, once again, on their age and ability. 
We also have a task card available in English, August Oswega, for you to use to explore this activity with children in your class. It can be found in the resources section of our website after the broadcast of today's webinar. And finally, here you can see some web links, some of which we mentioned earlier, where you might wish to explore the theme of sports equipment further. So I'll now hand you back to Kathleen to take us through the conclusion of today's webinar. Thanks, Kathleen. Thanks, Paul. Um, before we do so, I might see, is there any questions coming to us from the Q&A? Thanks a million, Kathleen. Um, we just have a question there following on from Paul's section from Seamus, who's asking, what could we do for the child who isn't interested in sport? So that's a super question. And Paul, you, you have already actually spoken about this. Um, sometimes we find that a child who isn't interested in sport might actually dislike the competitive nature of it, or perhaps it's just something about the actual sport that they don't like. So maybe you could focus on the development of skills, Seamus, instead of on a specific sport, and also explore the wide variety of lesser known sports which might appeal to such children. Who knows, maybe one day they could be standing with the President of Ireland as an ultimate Frisbee world champion, if you could just tap into that interest. So thanks a million Seamus for that great question and I'll hand you over to Kathleen now to take us through our resources. Thanks a million Michelle and thank you Seamus for that great question there. So let's just recap on the key messages of this webinar. Consider your own teaching and learning experiences in STEM as you read the following. Throughout these unprecedented times, PDST continues to support teacher professional learning remotely through direct bespoke school support, live webinars, and in developing a large range of online resources to support distance learning. As you can see from our website, we have an entire section devoted to distance learning, along with an additional section that gives you access to all the webinars in the Learning for All series in conjunction with the Teaching Council. PDST has also worked with Skullnet to produce a huge number of learning paths and other resources free for teachers to access. Our own team has developed specific resources for science, maths and STEM to support teachers in facilitating distance learning. This includes teacher manuals in Murlog as learning paths for maths and a lovely section on potential STEM learning experiences at home. Check it out at the link here. Our fortnightly e-bulletin STEM Swincha will be online from next Tuesday with the theme of summer, incorporating the strand of light and science and a variety of maths from all strands. So register for your early access to your copy at the above link. Following today's webinar, we will have a specific section for this webinar series. It will include a recording of today's webinar for you to peruse at your leisure, along with a bank of resources to support today's topics. This will include web links, templates and activity cards. So do feel free to share these supports with your colleagues. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many supports have arisen online for distance learning. On our own Twitter page, at PDST Primary STEM, we share resources daily from the many partners in STEM. We take a theme for maths and a theme for science each week and share an activity a day to support teachers in designing practical activities for learning at home. We have been delighted over the last few weeks to see schools sharing with us some of the activities they have taken from this webinar series. These are just a snippet of the many ideas and practices that are shared on the social media platform. A sincere thank you for sharing these with us. As mentioned in our introduction, this webinar series was designed to meet a need arising from the challenge of distance learning. And we are thrilled so many of you joined us. But we are really looking forward to getting back into schools to do what we do best, face to face. Contextualized support is key to our work in PDST, and we look forward to working with you all in your own context next year. For any queries regarding school support, see info at pdst.ie. And that brings us to the end of our fourth webinar, STEM and Sport, the final one in our STEM Sawalia series. We really hope that you have enjoyed it as much as we have and that you have plenty of ideas and resources to take you to the end of June and hopefully some that you will utilise in the classroom when you return. A huge thanks to all of our team for the work in designing this webinar and indeed the full series of webinars. Particular thanks to Siobhan and Barbara working on the Q&A uh, today and we really would appreciate your feedback 
um, to guide future design. So please complete the, the survey at the end of this webinar. And our final thank you goes to you, our teaching colleagues. Thank you so much for joining us each week for your positive comments and your insightful feedback that assisted us in fine tuning these webinars. We understand what a truly difficult time this has been and we appreciate your commitment to the hour of CPD each week. From all of us at PDST Primary STEM, our very best wishes to you and your school community as we come to a close on this unusual school year and look forward with hope to the next one. Until we meet again, Slán agus Bánacht. <laughs>